In today's show, it's a mailbag episode discussing how the Blazers should approach the 2024 NBA draft. Welcome, Locked On Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trail Blazers, your daily Portland Trail Blazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, world? It's your past first point guard and trail Blazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You listen to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube, free and available on all platforms. Coming at you each and every weekday, Monday through Friday. So make it a part of your daily routine. Make it your first listen and tell your friends to do the same. It's Locked On Blazers, your team every day. In today's show, it is a mailbag episode. Answering listener submitted questions from you, the listeners. If you want to get involved in a future mailbag episode, we're probably going to do these um, roughly once a week, give or take, um, until t- time in memoriam, until the games matter again. So, like 2026. 20, um, no, until, uh, but for, you know, for the rest of the regular season, at least, um, until we kind of roll into true off season content and we'll have a little, a little more in depth stuff. So, send me your questions. Um, I didn't, I didn't give you a heads up, but I did tell you last week when we did a mailbag episode that the place to do that is locked on blazers pod at gmail.com. One more time for you, locked on blazers pod at gmail.com had to add the pod because i didn't get the old email address from eric <laughs> that was five years ago it's too late now locked on blazers pod at gmail.com today's episode is focusing on sort of a theoretical approach to the nba draft these are these are questions sent by listeners just like you dear listener out there um who who, who are sort of curious about not the specifics of the nba draft just yet because we don't we don't the specifics are are un, are relatively unclear at the moment, but but what 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 maybe different approaches could be? And this first one comes from listener Nathan, who asks, "Would you dra- would you rather?" It's a classic. Would you rather? This is this is a this is mailbag to a T. Would you rather draft a guard with an upside of eight and a half or a wing slash big with an upside of seven? This is an interesting theoretical question because I think it pertains to both the present of the Blazers and the past of the Blazers and also the future of the Blazers, right? So would you rather draft a guard, like a smaller player with a higher upside or a size but lower overall upside with the, with the sort of obvious caveat here from Nathan doesn't add it but implied because uh I've exchanged e- emails with Nathan I know the implied caveats these days um th- that like nobody reaches their absolute absolute potential so you're expecting everyone to hit you know the 80 80 80 percent of what they can be so who would you, who would you rather have there's a couple things here um the but, First of all, it is it is undeniably true that over the last 30 years, uh, 40 years of, of NBA history, there have been very few teams where their best player is a guard. The Warriors, uh, but only probably two of their of their championships count um, in that regard, because the other two, they had freaking Kevin Durant. Um and and whether he was, I think he was better than Steph on those two championship teams. But you know, like if, if he wasn't, he was very similar, and he's freaking seven feet tall. And, and the Isaiah Thomas Pistons. Other than that, players, the best players on championship teams have typically just they've they, size wins. Um, you know, for for much of the league's history, centers and and from and then the sort of the the Jordans, the Kobe's, LeBron's, giant you know apex wings for for a long time. Um, who was the best player on the Pistons championship team, I guess is worth asking. But even then their point guard with Chauncey Billups was a big point guard, right? Um, he was the finals MVP. Was he their best player? Probably. What, you know, what, what does Ben Wallace count for? Um, I guess the other thing I want to bring up here is earlier this year, Becky Hammond, uh, head coach of the Las Vegas Aces, uh, WNBA champs, was on an ESPN show and 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 she said that the Knicks can't win a championship because Jalen Brunson is too small. And it got a hullabaloo and it was kind of we had a we had a I don't know a, a, a 36 hour life cycle of talking about this. We didn't talk about it on the show because I don't make it a point to talk about what sort of like nonsense <laughs> goes on at the four letter network. That's that's not what we do here. We try to keep it um Maybe a little smarter, maybe not much smarter, but a little smarter, a little more, a little more um, ironed, a little more sharpened, you know, ironed out. Um, 
But what Becky Hammond was actually saying was that not Jalen Brunson is too small. Jalen Brunson is not good enough. Because the real truth is that if you're trying to build a championship team, you need at worst like one of the three best players in the league. The Celtics might buck that trend this year. They might be good enough to win with with Tatum, who's something like the seventh or so best player in the NBA, but like an extremely good roster. Can you win just with with talent, depth of talent and not top tier talent? Because the history of the league and there's particularly the recent history of the league, top tier talent is what has won championships. So to answer Nathan's question in a roundabout way, as I am as I am want to do is Who's your second best player on that team if you're drafting a guard or a forward? I would argue that I think the fully healthy Memphis Grizzlies are a team that could win a championship or at least make the Western Conference Finals. And if you can make the Western Conference Finals, you can win a title. Would I pick them as favorites over the Nuggets? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But if they were fully healthy with with as good as Desmond Bain is and as good as I think Jaron Jackson Jr. can be and as good as John Morant is... That would be your best player as a point guard, but how good is your second best player? Is he defensive player of the year level? How good is your third best player? Is he a like a beefy wing who can shoot and get hot and defend? Like get hot to score 30 and defend in a playoff game? Then yeah, maybe it's okay. So to answer this question, I would always go with the talent. You know, the difference in eight and a half and seven is, first of all, it's kind of like on, on a scale of one to ten, is an amorphous idea, right? But if you're talking about someone with a, a point guard with a higher ceiling versus a, versus a wing with, with a slightly lower ceiling, give me the talent. Particularly the Blazers. Um, I think they need to get a swing for talent. This particular Blazer team doesn't need to draft a guard, but if you're just talking about theoretical approach to drafting, I think you have to, You it has to be, particularly when you're a sort of a, a, a ball of clay type of team, a young team, you got, you just have to draft talent. You have to draft talent. There is a world where I can see playing out in this particular draft where uh, Nikola Topic is on the board and he's a 6'6 point guard and the Blazers are in a really weird spot where they have him at the top of their board because they think he is, you know, the best offensive player in this draft, this draft class. And they are and they are in a in a strange they find themselves in a strange situation. I don't know what they'll do there, and if the Blazers end up with a pick that would, that that Topic would like clearly be in the range when we get a little bit closer, we'll talk about this more. But for me, I think you always draft talent because while you might not be able to build a Steph Curry, Isaiah Thomas championship level team with a point guard, adding adding a really good guard and then trying to build from there seems better than me than adding a pretty good forward and trying to build from there. That is sort of my theoretical approach to drafting is give me the talent, give me the upside, even knowing that size matters in the league, um, that like being bigger and more skilled is way more valuable than being smaller and more and, and skilled. You know, like if you're taking equally talented players and one of them is six, eight and one of them is six, four, you take the six, eight guy every day of the week. But if there's a little bit better at six foot three and, and somewhat limited at six foot nine. Give me talent. Give me talent. It's a talent league. I think you can figure it out there. And then you got to find the balance. You got to find the players that can complement those, complement your good guards. You can win with guards in the league. You just can't win the way the Blazers have been over the last decade, over invested in guards. Who's your second best player? I think that's the thing to think about when you're thinking about theoretical draft stuff. Who's your second best player? I understand the worry about Jalen Brunson too small. It only works with Steph and Isaiah and all those things, but. The, the secret to the NBA has pretty much been two things. Bigger is better, step one, which is why you end up with the forwards, and talent wins. I'm willing to lean in this era of the NBA that talent can win, but you're going to need high-level high level tall people regardless to, to win a championship. Regardless, you're going, you're going to need size to win a title. But um, in the draft, go for the best players. Go for the best players that seems like a novel idea, but I think people prefer fit and, and think about this positionality stuff um, a lot. And I think it's worth considering. So thank you, Nathan, for the question. In the next in the next segment, another mailbag question, another draft idea and how the Blazers might should and may approach the draft considering the team that they already have in the locker room. Let's talk about that in the second segment. First, I wanted to give you three words to think about. Passion, drive, patience. It's what brings home the winning trophy. It's also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers to roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. 
Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Plus, with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, baby, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. All right. Let's keep rolling with this mailbag edition special delivery mailbag for you we used to do these uh if every every tuesday was it was but this is a wednesday show and I, I don't have the rhythm like that to hit them every tuesday anymore because we're covering the games as they happen but five days a week wherever you get podcasts and if you want to be involved in one of these five days a week free on all platforms email me locked on blazers pod gmail.com like dr j did this next question comes from dr j who asks Assuming our, that's a collective pronoun, shout out to Dr. J for the collective pronoun, assuming our main roster is generally the same, and assuming that our high picks will probably be in the front court. It's double collective pronoun, and we got a future, and I think that, that we got, we've got a, we got a premise. The premise is that the Blazers are, you know, they've got, they got two draft picks, they're likely to be targeting players with size, they need some center depth, they desperately need some power forward depth, they could, you know, they have a bunch of intriguing young wings, but there's no, no reason to not, um, draft over the top of Chris Murray's and, and Jabari Walker's right now. Like they're not good enough to say, Oh, we got to make sure we can't draft over the top of them. Like the, I, I agree with the premise. You got the, the front court is where you need help. The back court's a little bit crowded right now and be weird to add another young guard. You have two very young, young, very young guards already on the roster. Um, a young vet and a true vet. also there also under contract as well. They got some decisions to make there. So assuming the premise right here from, from Dr. J is that is the main roster generally the same, no major changes, you know, maybe you trade Amphrey Simons, you trade Malcolm Brogdon, but let's not worry about what you get back in return. Let's just say the main roster generally the same. And you assume the pick is on a front court player, which of the primary NBA skills, shooting, passing, rebounding, defending, uh, blocking blocking shots getting steals w- which of the primary nba skills would be most important to possess at a quality level dr j actually wrote near starter level but i don't think any rookie you can say would have like a starter level like nba starter level skill on day one so let's talk let's just let's call it high level so the question is if you were thinking of, you know, front court players to add to the Blazers, and we won't get too specific on draft picks, this is more of a theoretical draft show. On uh, in today's program, you're listening to Ma- to March 27th show, Wednesday, March 27th show. I, pre- I appreciate you listening. Which which of the primary NBA skills would you prioritize? And I think I would prioritize them in roughly this order: shooting, playmaking, ball handling, rebounding. I think I would, I, I could be pretty easily convinced to make it shooting, playmaking, rebounding, ball handling. The rebounding is a problem. The Blazers are a terrible defensive rebounding team. Um, some of that is because they play DeAndre Ayton and uh, and Jeremy Grant in their front court. And DeAndre Ayton is a good rebounder, but he's not like a box out king. Um, you know, like somebody like the Lopez Lopez brothers who are like incredible box out artists. Um, so they don't always get the rebounds, but their teams always get rebounds when they're on the court. Uh, a la Steven Adams, who's, um, who's led the, t- led the league in defensive rebounding before, but, and offense rebounding in fact, but like his, he's a bo- he's just a box out monster. So his, his teams are always elite rebounding teams because he makes great physical contact. That's not who Deandre Ayton is. Good, good, good rebounder in his own right, but not great, like team rebounder. Jeremy Grant, Straight up terrible at rebounding. So I, I think you could, I think you could make the case. And and for all the Jeremy Grant's a three, like, good luck, good luck. It's not that fast. I'm pretty sure he's better guarding fours on defense. It just it, the rebounding is a real is a real issue with him, right? You need to play him next to another versatile rebounding forward like Jer- like Jabari Walker. It's um, skill set overlap matters more than position or like lack of over- overlap or um, skill set variation matters more than the more than positions. But I still think the number one is shooting. When I watch the Blazers play, I watch them occasionally make plays. I think DeAndre Ayton has improved a great deal as a passer as the season has gone on. His um, decision making is still maybe a little slow, but it used to be slow and kind of poor at the beginning of the year because I think his reads were okay. How am I going to make these reads? I think his reads have gotten a lot better. I'm just like, catch it, re- 
you know, scan the defense quickly and then swing it to the opposite side or, or, or pitch it back or whatever it is. Like him and Anthony have a, have a decent two-man game. They don't ping the ball back and forth like Jokic and Murray or anything, but they have a decent two-man game. And then when the double team comes, I think Aiton has gotten a lot better at making reads out of those double teams. But when you swing it to non-shooters, Chris Murray's open for a reason. Jabari Walker's open for a reason. Tumani Kamara has shot it better in 2024, but he's open for a reason. Um, you, you just don't have the shooting. I think Scoot Henderson has had some really nice passes over the last 10 days where it's like, that's an assist if you have an above average three-point shooter in, in the corner. You know, like that's that's a that's a bucket. Like he created a basket. He just didn't get rewarded for it. He's had a couple um, of these just like hook passes from, from outside the lane to the opposite wing where it's like, yeah, I mean... Jabari Walker missed it, but that's a great pass. Um, so shooting would be the thing like that I would that would I would prioritize in terms of like what skill would you want the rookie to have right away? Uh, then be playmaking. Um, you know, I I don't know if under Chauncey Billups the Blazers are ever gonna, you know, I, like let's just put put get your bets in now. Uh, like I'm sure at the media day next year the Blazers will be under if if Billups is still the head coach, be talking about how they're gonna play fast and move the ball and share the ball and all this nonsense let's just well, well i'll wait till i see that i will i would love to see that um they don't that's not what they do um and some of that is the skill set of the player of their best offensive players and some of that is just like i don't think billups has been able to put that imprint on offense but but the the skill set of the players matters he, his his ideal maybe he hasn't been to install but his ideal is that they'd have more guys who could dribble and pass and i think that playmaking particularly from a forward spots would be really really valuable forward uh, forwards who could playmake would be really really valuable not sure when i do a quick scan as i did before this that i see a forward who fits that um necessarily i mean yeah, I, I'm not sure that there's someone obviously in the draft that's like a high level play that, that's like their calling card is playmaking as you know in like a big frame. But you know, a big playmaker would be in, immensely valuable on this team. Like a, like someone who's not even a, like grab it off the rim and make plays, but like get it at the elbows and make decisions there. Uh, and like throw enter it in out of um, like at, uh, out of the high post and, and cut off of them and 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 make and make plays there. It would be immensely valuable. So I, I think shooting playmaking. And you know what? I am going to say rebounding third over ball handling. I do think the ability just to, to create, and I'm not talking about like um, just ball handling where you could like get the ball in six seconds on the shot clock where you can't really, you, you kind of got to go get it and you could at least get yourself into the paint from the, from the top of the key, and either make a player take a shot like that, that ball handling, just like the, the half court um, little bit of bag uh that that uh forwards could possess that would be that would be immensely valuable on this team but i think it's i, I would i'll give it i'll say rebounding as the as the other sort of primary skill that you that the blazers should want to target in that spot they they um they're a good offensive rebounding team that's been one of their calling cards one of the reasons they're a good offensive rebounding team is because they're a five crash team and by that i mean they let all five guys crash um Sometimes to their detriment, uh, there are smart people who would argue that, um, and I and I, I believe this to some extent. I'll think, although I think the Blazers are reckless with it to the point where it doesn't matter. But that crashing the boards forces other teams to hang back and try to box out, which limits their transition opportunities. But um, the Blazers aren't super disciplined with who gets to crash, so I think that doesn't happen as much. And sometimes you get guys out of the way. But the reason that they're good in offensive rebounding teams is because they they get after it as offensive rebounders. They're a five crash team. They're a bad defense re- rebounding team because of a skill skill set thing, and uh, it's harder to send five guys to the defensive glass based on flo- floor balance, right? It's like um, when you're on offense, you can attack the rim when the ball goes up. It's not really the same. There's not really the same principles when you're defensive rebounding because you're you're reacting to the shot and defending your man and all of those things. So, I think rebounding would matter. Um, I wouldn't. I don't necessarily think why why I had it lower for like specifically for in my when I initially did a pass at this for for draft skills is because I don't think that I would say okay you know you have the twelfth pick in the NBA draft what if you got a really good rebounder it's like I want I like for me for the way I would approach this if I was making decisions for the Blazers is just take a swing at high upside guys like you don't need high floor guys don't matter at this point. Like you, you need upside. You need you need guys who have chance to be really good, not p- guys who are already decent. Um, I'd rather just play Jabari Walker, who is a good rebounder with flaws, than chase a guy who's a good rebounder. I guess is is why I would be lower on the, for this specific exercise, like players to target in the draft. Certainly, the skill in and of itself, the Blazers could use more rebounders. But for draft picks, so so that that would be my three skills. We'll call it shooting, 
playmaking, rebounding, and then like a little bit of just like off the dribble juice as as the fourth thing. And those would be skills that you possess coming into the league. Obviously, the idea that players you draft develop well-rounded skills as as they get up, as they grow up in the league. Get better. I don't know what get up means in that situation as as they matriculate the, through their careers. Let's close the show talking micro skills. Those are the, we talked macro skills there, like sort of big picture skills. Last week I did an episode on micro skills, little skills, little small little bits and pieces of of the NBA uh, of the NBA's broader skill set that players could add to their games. And I made a call for listeners to send me some of their ideas, and uh, I got a couple a couple that I like, uh, and I will share them with you in the in the third segment to close the show. But first, let me tell you about Fire TV. Fire TV is your destination for sports and games, highlights, in-depth analysis. It's going to offer you an amazing viewing experience with smart TVs, as well as the Amazon Fire Stick that you can plug right into your existing TV that provides you access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV, whether it's opening weekend for baseball, which is coming up this weekend, or the college basketball tournament, which is upon us. You're going to want to have Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels that deliver content constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports fans brands for free that includes all of us at the lockdown podcast network available for you right there on fire tv plus most of the big pro sports leagues college conferences as well fire tv channels lets you dive into all of the game analysis highlights and more keep up to date on the latest world of sports from march madness to the nba to major league baseball and a whole lot more not to mention great news entertainment gaming tra- gaming travel and cooking videos as well check out the fire tv channels on fire tv and alexa devices and if you haven't Check out the Fire T our Fire our Fire TV channel. You should trust me. To learn more, visit amazoncom slash TV. That's amazoncom slash TV. Today's episode is also brought to you by our good friends at Nissan with their whole new lineup of SUVs that you are absolutely going to want to check out because you might be the type of driver that likes to push things a little bit further or you wonder what adventure could be around the next corner. Well, the the new 2024 Nissan lineup of SUVs has the capabilities to take your adventure to that next level, like the 2024 Nissan Rogue. Perfect for city drives, perfect for your great escapes. It's got classic exclusive Google built right into your always updating system that you can call on for almost everything. Gone are the days of getting into your, your car and having to connect your phone. Instead, you've got Google Assistant, Google Maps, and the Google Play Store built right into a 12.3 and HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is the perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. But if you need something a little bigger, why not the 2024 Nissan Armada? If you got the whole gang, well, the Nissan Armada is going to change what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to 8 in first-class luxury and style. Tow bigger, explore further in the 2024 Nissan Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Still a pass first point guard. I'm still Mike Richmond. You are still listening to Locked On Blazers. Still cruising through a mailbag episode, episode, special delivery mailbag. One more time for you. Locked On Blazers pod at gmail.com is a place to email me if you have questions um, for the show or you just want to want to um, get in touch with me. That's the spot I'm at. Last week's show uh, on Thursday's program, I did an episode on micro skills. It was the idea from watching... Um, Chris Murray made some three pointers in the first quarter of the game, hit three threes in the first quarter and said, you know, if Chris Murray just made open threes, like not even, not even like shooting in the broad, broad sense, not movement threes, not threes off the dribble, but if he just makes standstill unguarded, um, like practice level threes in the NBA, he'd be like, he would immensely change his trajectory like he's he's shooting um he's making about a quarter of his, of his like wide open threes as tracked by NBA.com. What, what if he hit 40% of those? Uh, he would get fewer if he made 40%, but like, what, what if he just, you know, what, what if he just doubled his output of, of, um, of, of just like unguarded wide open threes? It was the idea of micro skills, small things to add. And I offered things like DeAndre Ayton adding, a, um, adding a show and go like a pump fake move and, and Scoot Henderson adding, a, adding an offhand floater to, uh, to his arsenal and, um, 
and and sort of the the sort of again the the minutia of NBA skills, like the little things, not sort of broadly speaking. Like he could he he could shoot better. He like name a blazer that would be helpful for him. What if he shot better? But I put out the call to listeners said, hey, if you got a micro skill that you think would be could be added to the Blazers arsenal, what what would it be? And I got a I got a couple responses. The first one uh, comes from Jefferson. This this show famously popular with Jeffs and also popular with Jefferson's Uh, Jefferson offers this scoot to move quickly in the half court a micro skill of scoot to attack off the catch and I couldn't agree more this is a great one Um, I think scoot plays a little too fast in transition and I think once he gets going um, he can he can He's gotten better at this. His de- his deceleration and his changing speed has gotten way better. And his like pacing in the half court, where he's not always going so fast, has gotten a little better. But he tends to, and this is what Jefferson is talking about. I kind of edited this question from a longer email. But is the catch and survey? Uh, he catches it. He has Scoot Henderson has giant gigantic hands, and if you watch him play, it's very obvious he has gigantic hands because sometimes he'll catch it and he'll put the ball in one hand and just palm it and look around and kind of and kind of survey. But teams can load up against him. They're already going to sag off against him. If you give him a chance to to load up the help defense, which he's not getting a ton, but he's going to get a little bit, plus they're going to sag off on, on his jump shot, you're dealing with a lot more eyeballs, a lot more attentive eyeballs, and a lot less room. When Scoot recently has looked his best in the half court, particularly playing off the ball, is when he's played off the catch. When he catches it and, and attacks off that catch. Um, I'm sure there's like a scout term for that, but it's like when when he catches it and just immediately goes. It's what I've heard in the NBA from Monty Williams and a few other coaches described as 0.5 basketball. That means you make decisions within a half a second. You dribble, you pass, or you shoot within a half second. The ball keeps player and body movement to like keep moving so you don't catch it, survey, let teams ca- let teams load up, let teams uh, sort of uh, figure out what you're going to do and, 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 and plan their counter to defend it. When Scoot has played off the catch, he's been way, way, way better. You know, he's sometimes he'll, you know, get 90% of the rim and smoke a layup, get 90% of the way to the rim and smoke a layup or, you know, uh, you know, some other skills get caught with him, but uh, get caught, catch up with him. But, um, the idea that he plays a little quicker in the half court, particularly when he's off the ball, quicker decisions off the ball as as someone who can slash. I love that as a micro skill. Play off the catch. Play quickly off the catch. I love that. That's a, that's a really good one from Jefferson. The other one is from listener Scott who offers DeAndre Aiden becoming a DHO hub. That is dribble handoff hub. Someone who can run dribble handoffs, uh, as, as Scott mentions in his email. Not like Nikola Jokic, like we're not, we're not being greedy here, but what about Kelly Olenek? Kelly Olenek's pretty good at dribble handoffs, and and that's like a maybe a sort of a level of, of um, you know, DHOs aren't reads where you have to read a help defender. They're more of a timing, and, and, and it's a read, but it's like it's a you and the guy coming at you kind of timing thing and feel thing. It's, it's probably easier to develop that craft working with a typical, uh, you know, pick and roll partner, whether that be Scoot, whether that be Anthony Simons. I think particularly Simons because of the way he would be defended. Guys are going to go over the top of screens. DHOs can be more valuable than Scoot, who te- guys are going to go under. So it's like, go under, hand it off. We don't care. Um, uh, but I agree that D- uh, that Aiton as a DHO hub uh, would be a lot better. I will say this. Other guys on the team, on the Blazers, run dribble handoffs much better than Aiton. Uh, recently, I think uh, Chris Murray has attacked it a couple times where he's caught the ball and, like, and dribbled towards the wing. That's sort of um, the action where you get the ball on the wing and the, and the guard is in the corner and you dribble towards him and he's, or, or, or turn towards him like you're going to hand off and he just faked the handoff and got to the rim. Tumani's done that a couple times, the so fake handoff, get to the rim. Duop Reith has done it a couple times, fake the handoff and get to the rim. Like they, they, There are other guys on the team that have done it better than him recently. Um, and, like, and this is just in the last like 10 days, maybe the last like five games. This is I've seen this. the Blazers kind of pull this off. Aiden doesn't really have that in his game. Um, it's just not part of part of his arsenal right now. But becoming like having that be part of, especially because he's such a good mid range shooter, and you have to kind of his man would have to stay attached when he was when he would um, run handoff actions, or or they'd have to switch it, and then he could shoot over the top. But like shooting bigs as um, as a as a handoff partner is really hard to deal with because you have to, if you're trying to guard two with two guys, but you have to account for someone flying off of a handoff and, you know, either turning the corner or, or flaring out to get a three. And you don't want to leave a big man open for like an 18 foot jump shot. And Deandre Ayton, 
you know, one of the best 18 foot jump shots, jump shooters in the game that, that provides a real, um, a real challenge. Those are, those are two micro skills. I really like Scott with the DHOs for Aiden and Jefferson with the scoot attacking off the catch and moving more quickly and more decisively in the half court. Two good ones. Uh, if you have one locked on blazers pod at gmail.com, um, I'm obsessed with the little improvements that, that players can add to their games. Um, the big macro improvements, they're really fun, but the little things like, oh, now he pivots le- and now he does an inside pivot to his left. I love, like, that's the stuff that um, the true basketball dork in me really appreciates. Um, so if you've got one, lockedonblazerspot at gmail.com. If you've got questions, lockedonblazerspot at gmail.com is what we do five days a week wherever you got podcasts and also on YouTube. Tomorrow's show, uh, the Blazers are in Atlanta to play the Hawks on uh, this evening. You're listening to Wednesday, March 27th show, and they're in, the, they're in Atlanta to play the Hawks this evening. We'll recap that game, and we'll talk about uh, NBA prospects to watch in the Sweet 16 and the Elite 8. That starts on Thursday and runs through the weekend, uh, the, the, the last the last big rounds of the men's NCAA tournament before we get to final four weekend. Sounds a good show. We'll do another one on Friday, wherever you get podcasts. Also on YouTube. I appreciate you listening. I'll talk to you soon.